it's great. LPs are so excited. They're getting so much money back that they're, they just can't wait to throw money back into VC funds. Well, the problem is we've hit a wall, and it's the exit wall. Exit activity is down, and this will be a good transition to kind of get into exits. Uh, exit activity is down, and a big part of the reason why is because of the private <coughs> IPO. How many people have heard the term private IPO? A few. Private IPO essentially is when a company traditionally would have IPO, in the current environment, they're just not doing so. Because, as we mentioned, those tourist investors are swooping down into the private market, and they're giving them as much money as they would be raising in the public market. So they have no need to go public, go under the public scrutiny uh, as a public company. They're getting the same amount of money in the private market. So they're saying, hmm, I'll just take this investment from Tiger Global or Fidelity, and I'll stay private. Well, the problem with that is investors eventually need to get their money back. They need to get paid. And we see that now in the distributions in 2015. Those are starting to come down a lot of these late stage companies that should be exiting, they should be getting the public markets, they should be uh, getting acquired for massive, massive totals, like Apple and Google, it's just not happening. And we see here uh, essentially an overview of uh, exit flow. We have the line, again, is total exit count by uh, PE buyout, IPO, uh, or by corporate acquisition. Um, so it's all clumped together into that uh, exit count line. And then the bars, obviously, are total exit value. And then in the 2015 bar, you can kind of see broken down um, how, <coughs> what proportion of exits in 2015 was by acquisition, by IPO, by buyout. So again, um, we see a slight dip in exit activity from 2014 to 2015. But much like the one of those previous charts, if you broke this out in the quarters, you would actually see that on the back half of 2015, there was a much more dramatic drop in exit activity. And it's becoming a real big issue. Now, on the M&A side, on the acquisition side, there's a couple reasons why there haven't been as many M&A transactions. Number one, valuations are at record levels. <coughs> Corporate and strategic acquirers do not want to pay top dollar to acquire these companies. Number two, a big reason is they don't want to inherit a company that has the burn rate that some of these uh, unicorns do. Two big reasons why corporates are staying away. Although those deals are happening, much, much fewer. Um, now, on the IPO side, a few reasons why a few reasons why companies are not going public. Number one, IPO market is just uninvited. Tech stocks currently are not doing that well. Um, I, you know, IPOs, especially VC-backed tech IPOs, have been very few and far between. In fact, I have a list of the notable uh, tech IPOs in 2015: Square, Pure Storage, Etsy, and Box. Uh, most of those have been underperforming. You look at Twitter, a tech stock, severely underperforming. So these, these unicorns are, especially on the tech side, are really afraid to uh, test the waters there. Um, and then with, with the theme that I mentioned of growth over profit, it's, it's an issue for going public. Because when you go public, when you hit the public market, you have to have your fundamental financials very solid because you're going to have analysts on a daily basis poking holes in your numbers. Are you growing? Uh, how's your net income? Uh, net cash flow? All of those kind of things have to be solid. And a lot of these companies just are not there. They are huge companies. They have a ton of market share in the industries that they reside. They have a ton of users, but at the end of the day, they're just not making money. And it's hard to hit the public market and be a successful IPO when you don't have those metrics. So those companies will definitely have to, to work on that more and focus less on growth moving forward. Um, and there's, you know, there, a, a term we throw around is a haircut IPO. I feel like a lot of these unicorns where you go public, 
there's no way they would garner a market cap on the, in the public markets that they held in their last private valuation. And they just don't want to do that. Hey, private investors just valued me and my Series D at $5 billion. I don't want to IPO at a market cap of $2 billion. So those are some of the reasons why you know, IPOs have definitely been few and far between. In fact, in one Q2016, zero VC-backed U.S. tech IPOs. And I don't know when the last time this happened. Well, um, we'll touch uh, on here just briefly. Um, this just shows, uh, you know, I talked about there's more and more companies. Uh, the company inventory uh, is just increasing every year. This is just total VC-backed companies in existence currently. And you see how many in 2015 are early stage or seed round. Uh, oh, well over two-thirds are at the seed or early stage. And a lot of these companies will be needing to get follow-on investments soon. And unfortunately, they won't be able to. Fuel activity is declining, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. Now we're going to get into some region-specific trends. I know you guys like this. Uh, Washington State and uh, the Pacific Northwest in general. <coughs> And here's an interesting one. Uh, more Washington-based companies raising capital. Um, the, the most interesting thing here for me is the jump from 2014 to 2015. When you look at the general trend, <coughs> you guys remember how that started to come down. Uh, venture activity started to decline across the U.S. Uh, but in Washington, there's actually quite a significant bump from 2014 to 2015. 301 in 2014, 355 um, in 2015. And the amount of capital invested increased as well. So those are all good things. You just said about 3.7. Yeah. Uh, a couple slides left. So yeah, uh, Washington accounts for 70% of capital invested in the Pacific Northwest since 2013. We're counting Oregon, Idaho, and British Columbia. You can see how much uh, the state of Washington dominates venture capital activity. Of course, the Seattle metro area really drives that, and our tech scene um, is incredible. And it's, it's really fun to see Seattle uh, companies continue to get funded. This is much like uh, the previous slide that covered all of US, but it's just interesting to see that, uh, or it's nice to see that we have the same trend going here in Washington State. You have uh, the angel and seed deals really, really increasing uh, over the last few years. Um, so that's that's obviously amazing to see. I believe this is the last slide. Um, angels accounting for an increasing proportion of investors in Washington companies. Um, so that's obviously a, a great thing. Uh, very relevant to, to this to this room, and I think. Uh, it's interesting in general. I think um, angels are, are, you know, angel networks, angel syndicates, angel groups are really becoming uh, more and more common. You know, whereas I've been at Pitchbook for uh, over three years, and uh, our coverage was mainly on, you know, venture capital, uh, venture capital later rounds, early stage, and some seed stuff. But um, more and more, we're hearing and talking about angel investment. So it, it's really cool. And it's really nice to be here today and get to meet a lot of you and, and, and present this data to you. So um, I don't know if we'll have time for questions, but if, if we will have some time to chat afterwards, I'd love to answer any questions and have some specific data points for you guys. I'll just leave some contact information up for you. If you'd like, 